means a lot of things. One, she forgot an earring. No. <laughs> means I'm not on. All right. Matthew chapter 2. I am picking up where we were Christmas, and I don't expect you to remember that. The title of the message actually was one of the titles we had at Christmas. A different approach. Matthew chapter 2, and then over in Matthew 21. The wise men say this to Herod, the ruler, the king of Jerusalem or Israel, Judea. This is what they say. Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen a star in the east and have come to worship him. And then over in Matthew chapter 21, we'll begin in verse... I'm going to go ahead and begin in verse 5. Well, this is last Sunday. This would be Palm Sunday scripture. Last Sunday was Palm Sunday. Today is Resurrection Day. So here's what it says. Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. That was a prophecy given by the prophet to God's people. They had held on to it. They had held on to it with an expectancy, looking for and anticipating the coming of what they called the Messiah, or you and I would call Christ. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt. They laid their clothes on them and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitude who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? So the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. If they knew, if they had the opportunity to repeat today what they know now, they would say, Who is this? This is the King of kings and Lord of lords. He has come as Jesus. The King is coming. The king has come. The king will come. But he wants to come. The king wants to come to some of you. Like I, just like he did Jake on Thursday night as the king came into his presence, he wants to come to you. This whole idea of Jesus and of God, of Jesus being God and Jesus being the King of kings and Lord of lords, runs from the very beginning. That's why I took you back to Matthew. Even the Gentiles knew that there was a king that was coming to God's people. They had traveled long ways to come in anticipation of seeing the king that had come to God's people. I don't know whether they were surprised when they finally found Jesus as a small child and thought, huh, I thought he'd be a little bit bigger. I thought he'd be in a little bit better conditions. I thought he might have a few servants around him. But either way, they were able to recognize Jesus as the king who had come. One that they had knew was coming, but who had come, and they found both. They knew the one who was going to come and they found the one who had come and they did what they were supposed to do to a king. They gave him riches, they bowed down and they worshipped him. But then from there on throughout scripture, this idea of Jesus being king just is kicked into high gear. John the Baptist comes and says, I am the one who comes to tell you that the kingdom of, of God is at hand. It's coming. He was a herald, one that was to come and to prepare the people. And so that's what he did. And so he constantly went around saying, the king of heaven is coming. The kingdom of God is at hand. Then we hear it in Jesus' baptism. As the Holy Spirit declares, this is he. This is the one. 
And John the Baptist even knows before he does the baptism, he said, hey, look, I'm not worthy to stoop down. I can't even tie your shoes or undo your sandals. You are far greater than me. We find it declared by the demons. Everywhere Jesus went, demons cried out and fell down at his feet, saying, Son of David, Son of God. They knew his authority and power. They even would say, Has the time come for you to do with us what needs to be done? They were afraid of him. They trembled him at his presence. They knew that who he was king. Then Jesus begins his ministry. Listen to what Jesus does. He preaches the kingdom of God is at hand. He practices being king. He's king over the Sabbath, if you remember. He, when men taught, tell him, what are your disciples doing out there picking for, um, grain on, on the Sabbath day? He says, do you not know that basically I'm the king of the Sabbath? When a man, when he heals on the Sabbath, he lets them know that I'm the king of the Sabbath. In other words, I'm the king of every day. God never takes a rest. God is the king of every day. Do you know that God is a king of every day and not just for that little bit of time when you're in here? Or just that few times? when you decide you're going to get up and you're going to go worship. You know, he's the king of every day. When you get up and you make the preparation to go to school or you get up and make the preparations to go to work, you know, he's the king there too. He's the king of all. Jesus preached the kingdom of God. He practiced being king. He was a king over the Sabbath. He was king over the temple. He marches into the temple and he runs out everybody as though he was in charge. And they even asked him, by what authority are you doing this? This is my father's house. And you've turned it into a den of thieves. You have no business here so I'll make sure you run out. I think that's interesting. You know, Jesus cleansed the temple twice at the beginning of his ministry before he did anything else and at the end of his ministry. And I think it's interesting that Jesus, in, at the beginning of his ministry, doesn't say you all come. He tells a whole bunch to get out. Now, which ones does he tell to get out? The ones who really don't have a clue about what it is to know him as king and lord now they can say it they can tell it but they really don't know what it's supposed to look like in their life do you really know what it's supposed to look like in your life or can you just tell it cleanse he's the king of the temple and he's king of the sacrifices that's the reason on why Jesus' sacrifice is the only acceptable sacrifice. Now, if you were there Friday night, I can go into much more detail, but it's mainly because there is no other sacrifice that is acceptable. Only God can be the ultimate sacrifice for our sins because he's king over all sacrifice. He's the, he has authority over all things. At the Mount of Transfiguration, God the Father declares, hey, this is my son. In him, I am very, very pleased. You need to listen to what he says. Let's jump to our scripture, though. This is... In the timeline of Jesus and his death, Matthew 21 is the Sunday before. Now, for some of them, I think it is a different Sunday. It's just, they recognize that 
what they believe is the Messiah has actually come to Jerusalem and is walking down before them. They see him on the donkeys and they go to great length. They take their, their coats and robes off and they lay them down for him to walk on. They cut branches. In other words, they put a lot of energy in it. And then they stand along the side and it's a parade and they shout, Hosanna, Hosanna, this is the one, this is the one. But come Friday, five days later, they either choose not to be present or choose to be silent while they're present. Because there's another parade. Several miles, Jesus will be marched from Pilate's presence to Calvary. And it's a very different parade. There, no one is shouting Hosanna. There, no one is singing praises to him. There, no one is cutting branches and laying things down on him. There, there is no beast of burden to carry him. There, he is the beast of burden. There, everyone is mocking him, laughing at him, spitting at him. You know the story. You, most of you have been in church long enough to know what happens on, on Friday. So how in the world can it be that people, they're all still there. It's the Passover week. So they're still there in Jerusalem. It's not like they left. They're still there. How in the same week can you have two different parades? One filled with incredible joy and celebration for Jesus coming in as the King of kings and Lord of lords, and at the other one, nothing but anger. And Evidently, some of you have not been real with your Christianity, have you? Do you not find yourself in both of those places at times? Have you not ever, ever been filled with such great joy and a spirit of worship where you just in awe at him and you're worshiping him? And then things don't go the way exactly the way you want it and the doubt comes into you. Maybe even anger. Maybe he asked him to save a marriage. Or save the life of someone that you love. Your faith used to be up here, but after that experience, your faith is down here somewhere. Your walk with the Lord used to be way up here. Oh man, you could tell everybody about how, how, how great and how mighty and how he was always present, but something happened and all of a sudden... It's not so much that you spew out anger. You've just become silent. And you let the world declare. And faith is a living thing. It's not a dead thing. It's not something that you put in a bank and deposited somewhere it's supposed to grow it's supposed to grow in interest it's not just something you deposited somewhere it's supposed to be alive because you are alive and you live in a world where the enemy is just as present as God and the demons take many many shapes and sometimes it's even the ones you love sometimes the ones you live with sometimes the demon is you Sometimes sometimes you look bipolar, schizophrenic. Don't take any personal references to that to any of you that are. And I recognize that that is a major struggle. But sometimes we act like that in our spiritual faith. One moment we're extremely hot and sold out to him. And the next moment people look at us and wonder. And we look at ourselves and wonder, where am I? Sometimes we go through periods of life like Forrest was talking about 
where though we may not really want to be identified with those that crowd on Good Friday, we still like to hang out with them. We still like to do things with them. Though we may not go with them to that street on that day, we spend so much time with them that it wouldn't be a surprise to them or to us if all of a sudden we did get caught up in a moment where we do find ourselves there. It's not that we wanted to be there. It's just that their influence, listen to me, their influence in your life was greater than his. Have you ever been there? I did this illustration, and I wasn't planning on doing it this morning. It was a lot easier to do it on, on dirt than it is on a concrete floor. Um, Thursday, Thursday night, no, I preached Friday night. Friday night when I preached, I did an illustration over in Matthew where Jesus says, you know, there are two paths. One is very, very wide. And it's wide because there's many, many people going on it, but there's many, many ways. And they just literally line up to each other side by side trying to go down this path. And, and it seems like the Broadway just keeps getting wider because somebody else keeps dreaming up another way and it just, it just keeps getting wider. And there's many, many, many that are going down that path. But that path doesn't lead to God. That path leads to destruction. And then Jesus says, but then there's a narrow path. And the word of narrow means a thin, very thin, narrow path. You can't get down this thin, narrow path side by side. It is only able to go down one person. That's it. It squeezes you in. To get down that narrow path, you have to follow someone. And that happens to be Jesus. Meaning that there's only one way down that narrow path, and it happens to be Jesus. And because there's only one way and only one person you can follow, then if you try to go down any other path, then you're just adding yourself to all the other wide paths. It's not about Jesus coming up behind you or walking beside you. It's about you following him because... He's the King of kings and Lord of lords. And He's the one you're supposed to be. And any time you and I find ourselves not walking in... Our American Baptist glasses so distorts the Scripture for us. You see, we read that passage as though it was a one-time thing. I got on that path. I'm following Jesus and it's very tight and narrow. But none of us live that way. And you know that. Don't you? We spend most of our life struggling whether we're going to stay here. And every time we are forced to make a decision, every time we come up against with something that the one we're following wants us to do, but we don't like, we find ourselves backing up. And we join the many. It is true that the, 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 the way we usually use this is about heaven and hell. And that is true. But have you ever seen a judgment come upon a believer because they choose... to step out of that narrow path for a moment? Sure you have. Some of you know what it's like. We don't talk about that. It's not about eternal security or not. You see, that's the thing. Our faith is a living faith. It is a constant thing. Jesus told a parable, and I'm going to get back to the illustration in the, it, both of those are found in that, that passage is found in, in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7 it's also in Matthew chapter 7 where Jesus says 
Make your yeses be yeses and your noes no. Now we use that for all kinds of things. If I make a promise to you, I'm supposed to make sure I keep my promise to you. I'm supposed to keep my promise. I don't have the right. It's, I'm, if I'm going to be a man of integrity, if I'm going to be a person that you will trust, then when I pr- say something to you, you expect me to, if I say yes to something you ask, you expect me to keep my yes. If I'm a man who says yes to you, but I'm constantly living a no, then you're not going to think much of me. You're not going to trust me much. You're not going to ask me to do much because I'm going to be a constant failure or disappointment to you. That's the way we use that passage. But in the context of that scripture, Jesus is talking about his relationship with God, and he's saying this, if you said yes to him, then you make it a yes. Don't leave that path. Don't start following him and decide. He said, well, you know, he wants me to do it. I don't think I want to. You see, you don't have a choice. You and I live and think that we can, things are negotiable. We think that we got a choice. That if he asks us to do something that's in his word or he speaks to our heart, that we can debate with him. That we can compromise it. It doesn't work that way. You're either yes or no. But sadly, most of us know that we live most of our life doing both. Yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. Jesus told a parable. of a master, of a ruler, of a king. Who had a servant, servants. He said to one, this is what a king can do, to, by the way, if you happen to be following this king and he says to you, go do this. One said, sure. Sure. but he never did it. Never did it. He said yes, but he never did it. The other one said no. But after a while, he began to feel bad about saying no to the master. And the Bible said that he went out and did what he had been asked even though he had said no and then Jesus says which one really is following me which one is really following me which one really is my servant which is the one that does the heart and desire of me the one who says yes but never really follows through or the one who says no and then says yes and does what they say well you know the answer The one that really is the follower is which one? The one that ends up following. Which is your life? Which is your life? Are you one that can declare all that Jesus has done for you in all of the resurrection, all of his ascension, all of his glory, that he's the king of kings and lord of lords? And can you just say, you know what? I made a decision to follow him. But do you live most of your life saying no? Or, or worse yet, do you have conditions on what you're going to say yes to? You know what that looks like? Well, God, I'll do anything, but, but it's got to be right here. It's got to be within this area. I'm not, I'm not going to do those kind of things. So don't even ask me, God. You see, every time we say no in any way, we declare ourselves to be king. Any of you ever lived under a king? No. No. No, we don't really know other than textbooks and stories what it's like to live under a king we don't know what it's like I'll come back to that in a second Calvin come here for a second there was another chill out you're okay I didn't choose you because your looks 
I chose you for your size. There was another illustration that I used on Thursday night, and that was the one for the word humble. Every, every word in the Hebrew and Greek has a picture to it, an image that when they heard it, they said, okay. By the way, we have some of those. If I tell you that a story about a sower, you immediately think of a man that's out sowing. If I tell you about a soldier, you think of, a, you think of Paul McCauley. <laughs> you think of a soldier. If I tell, use the word stronghold, and you probably think of a castle or a tower, something in your mind triggers that. Well, the same thing was true for them. The word humble came from what they saw in God's creation to a weed or a branch or a bough that was blown by the wind and bent and bent it was that's humble it gives itself to the wind to give yourself to the wind is to be humble so this is what they thought it looked like for a man to be humble put your hand on my back and tried and push me down push me down but it's not this. This is not humble. This is not humble. This is nowhere near humble, and it's nowhere near submission. And yet, that's what we define submission and humble. Humble is, put your hand on my back, push me down. That's it. You're done. And thank you. Humble is one who submits to the hand of God willingly, and submissively and does not fight and yet can you think of anyone that you would declare as submissive who isn't more fighting no very hard we don't have a clue about what it is to be humble before his presence because we're constantly fighting. And we're constantly fighting by saying, Yes, Lord! No, Lord! Yes, Lord! No, Lord! And we fight over the stupidest things. We make the small things that he desires for us to do to be the big things. And that's where we're submissive. Oh, yeah, we might, we might say, Well, I'm going to be on church on Sunday. But, but getting rid of that or doing that, No, 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 that's a little too far, God. Do you understand? It doesn't matter whether it's a little thing or a big thing. If you're resisting his hand, you're not humble and you're not submissive. You're saying yes and living a no. And you're excusing it. Why? Because you've decided that it's more important for you to be king and lord of your life than it is for him. Let's finish with this example. So in that passage about the broad way and the, the narrow way, it says many will go down the broad way and few will go down the narrow path. The image that they saw in their mind was this many few many There will be billions. Billions, probably even trillions. Even now in hell. Because they chose the Broadway. But there will be few. Few. 
you. There will be few that will make their yeses yes. There will be many that will say yes, but fill up their lives with other yeses. Things that actually they'll be more committed to than to him. And they will tell themselves that they're going to get in. You realize how many stories and scriptures you can tell of Jesus that he told you. And every one of them, he tells you it doesn't work that way. But you keep choosing to believe it does. Why? Because the Bible, Jesus said, man rather receive a lie than the truth. So what have you said yes to? That God doesn't want you saying yes to. Are you really any different? Am I any different than that crowd that at one time raising their hands, singing praises, but the very next day or just a few days later, they choose to be absent, silent, or they join the crowd? Jake, the path that you have chosen to follow is very, very narrow, meaning it's very, very restrictive. You don't get to define what it looks like. But the Holy Spirit will let you know when you're not looking like what it's supposed to look like. Right, Forrest? Right, the rest of you? So right now, Don't talk to me about a prayer you prayed or a baptism you had. Do you really think that's going to work with God? Who's king of your life? Who's Lord? He has come. He wants to come. And one day he will come. And when he comes then, you won't get to have a a sermon and an invitation like you do now. Because when he comes, those invitations end. Those times come to an end. So take a good look at your path and which path you are on. Are you the enemy, the many that is wasted? Or are you still the few? I still got a little bit shining. Some of the few that are still in his, that are in his hands. Jesus loves you. But he loves you as king of king and lord of lords. And he invites you to say no, really no. To all the things that the world offers and all the other paths and he invites you to come and to follow him and him alone that is the path of salvation but it's the path to continual revival as well so let me ask was there a time in your life when you were closer to him than you are now? If there was, then you desperately need to come back to where he is. Father, by your Holy Spirit, I pray, Father, that you would cast the net Spirit of conviction. Spirit of drawing. 
The spirit that casts out darkness and lies and allows truth to come in and to be received. For you to be high and lifted up as King of kings and Lord of lords. I pray, Father, for many to leave the long and broad path and follow into that narrow path of following you as Lord and Savior, as King of kings and Lord of lords. I pray, Father, that the imagery of the many and few would not be the history of Sturgis Chapel Baptist Church, though I am afraid that that will be our history. I ask you to change that. That we will be a people of yes and not yes and no. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Stand and do what you need to do. If you need some time alone, come over to this side. If you need someone to pray with you, come here. If you need to talk to me, you come now.